Well, welcome back. Of course, I'm George, and we're always glad to have you here with us today. So don't hesitate to comment below, email, call me, whatever the case may be. Uh, we get to them all. Now, we're going to do um, the follow-up video of the tr complete truth about methanol. Um, and this one is really more informational, and I'm going to condense it as much as possible. Um, because if you're armed with a lot of great information that's true uh, and factual, you'll find out that in your conversations with friends and others, you'll be much, much more influential. And you'll walk around and walk away knowing that you are correct. But please, check me. Okay, let's move. Look, methanol poisoning is a worldwide issue, okay? It, it is happening worldwide, and it has happened worldwide for a long, long time. But we want to answer these basic questions is, how is that possible? Why does it continue? And what do I need to know? We'll answer all of those. But be forewarned that I've got to stay focused because I can't answer many questions about other regions of the world, but I can definitely talk fairly intelligent about the United States and what caused our prolific problem that we experience from 1920 to 1933 and it has still continued since then to a lesser degree but it still continues now bottom line how is this possible it's possible because people are people um, we're always looking for an, a more inventive and an ingenious way of making more money it's a financial gain process in a lot of cases um, and sometimes it's unintentional and a lot of times it is intentional we'll get to that but it's a money-making process because methanol is a whole lot cheaper it's produced by governments all around the world it's denatured alcohol they call it denatured because it's made undrinkable but if it's used to spike alcohol that you've made or sold as alcohol um, and a lot of times to our poor and impoverished countries and or neighborhoods, um, well, then there's a great financial gain out of that. So that's why it's possible. And it's possible because it's just so darn hard to enforce or to police. So we've got to do this ourselves. Oh, why does it continue? There, I've already said it. We've got to do it ourselves. And what do I need to know? All right. Let me get set up here and watch. Good. We're set. Methanol in the U.S. Now, here's how, and everybody worries about it. Now, and you remember the video we did for the complete truth of methanol about the amount of methanol, the amount produced, the amount necessary in order to have an adverse effect on the body? Of course, anything that you ingest in uh, extreme doses or extreme amounts can be poisonous to include ethanol uh, but in moderation your body can handle and withstand it methanol is one of those different toxics or toxins that the body just can't seem to metabolize uh, after a very small amount is introduced so the, you know the temperance movement we had in the United States started in around, around 1804 and the temperance movement was a group of very influential people it was religiously based and they had great intentions in the first place uh, they wanted to bring America back to moral upstanding cultural God-fearing nation and there was nothing wrong with that but in in that itself they saw that the adverse effects of alcohol in family units and across our nation was having an ad it was it was adverse it was having an adverse effect um, on family units, on law-abiding citizens, etc., etc., etc. Now, it's interesting to note, though, that you know, up until prohibition started, you know that 70%. You keep this figure in mind. 70% of the revenues generated by the U.S. government was generated by the revenue collected from alcohol tax. Look, even George Washington, our first president, ran his own still. And made money from it so uh, alcohol was something that was just traditional it was it was normal and everything seemed to be okay now 
the anti-saloon league got involved and they came on board and they ran around they were rampant in larger cities and larger states uh, with larger populations and trying to shut down saloons and they were just all anti-drinking um, and we're all familiar with that with the history you'll see all the posters and the signs and the show that that's all old. <laughs> now remember World War One ended in 1917 now remember we talked about the 70 percent revenue you know World War One was very very expensive my gosh we were only what 60 years off of the back of the end of the Civil War and still paying off the debt that we had from the Civil War when we went into World War One so there was a movement that started long before prohibition started and what's interesting is that I'm gonna put this in a box over here so that you can keep track of it in 1913 the 16th amendment was approved and ratified and went into effect shortly thereafter that amendment was the collection of income tax in the United States so the government was permitted by Constitution to levy tax on your income there was I'm sure uh, there was a focus on the loss of alcohol revenues knowing that a few short years later and we were already getting wrapped up for world, rolling up into World War one we had to pay off debt we knew we were going to incur more debt uh, this was going to happen. This this was necessary at the time. So World War One ends in 1917, and now we've got this huge debt. Now prohibition, prohibition started in 1920 and ended in 1933. Thirteen years of uh, a, what some people call a terrible time in the United States. It all depends on which side of the fence you land on. But remember that the 18th Amendment in 1917 the 18th amendment was passed and ratified and to get ratified what happens is it's passed by Congress and it, then three quarters of the states they all the states have to hold their own elections three quarters of those states have to approve it and then it's ratified and then it becomes a constitutional amendment so it passed in 1917 didn't go into effect until 19 I got that sun here somewhere. No, there it is. Until 1920, and that's because it took about three years or so for it to become ratified. Now, during the same time, is when they, when when, when Congress passed the Volstead Act. It, the Volstead Act was a, a law that created the prohibition units, and what the purpose of was the enforcement of prohibition in the United States. Uh, now that was left under the IRS because the IRS was responsible for all of that. La da da da. Okay. Now that Volstead Act went into effect at about the same time that prohibition went into effect. Now some interesting things happened after that. It was left under the IRS for a long period of time, and now you're starting to remember those terms like all oh, the revenueers. And depending upon communities or states or locations anywhere, depending on how they viewed prohibition had a big impact on how well or how not so well it was enforced. So it wasn't fair across the board in the first place. Look, in 1928, Herbert Hoover beat Al Smith in the election for President of the United States. What's well known is that Herbert Hoover was a temperance movement supporter. And he actually called prohibition at one point in time when he said it was a a great experiment with a noble I don't want to I don't uh, with a, a noble endeavor uh, and that's not a quote but it's it's in those words <laughs> so he thought it was a good thing so what that did was that actually guaranteed that after 1920 when prohibition went into effect that in 1928 Herbert Hoover it was going to continue on anyway but a couple of interesting things happened uh, in 1929, we had two events that took place that were really important. One of them you'll know about. It's called the stock market crash. And the other one is Elliot Ness. And we're all familiar with Elliot Ness. He's a famous guy. Okay, Elliot Ness was put in charge of the prohibition unit, but now it was moved under the Department of Justice, and he was part of the untouchables. Couldn't be bribed, couldn't all that stuff. Now, so 
understand that what happened between let's get rid of this what happened between 1920 and 1933 there were several times during that period that the government interfered or got involved in <coughs> the developing separate uh, mixes of toxins in order to insert that into alcohol that the government had to produce anyway because alcohol was still necessary for a lot of different purposes. One was medical, then there was industrial, uh, there were chemical analysis and things. So you still needed alcohol, but you didn't need alcohol that was palatable to drink. You just needed alcohol for its base. So the government made a bunch of it. So it was available. Well, you know, the mob got an idea gangsters, bootleggers, come, come on, we, we all know that story. They got their hands on a bunch of it and they started using it to taint because it was so cheap. It was dirt cheap compared to making liquor or trying to smuggle liquor across the Canadian border. So, and so they were doing that. And in some places, some unscrupulous people were selling it just as it was and again to our poor and lower income neighborhoods and communities. Uh, so this started to cause a problem, which was alcohol poisoning, well, methanol poisoning. Because the amount of methanol that they were using to cut with was way, way drastic. It was way, way more than, in a lot of cases, a lethal dose. That's where our problems with, oh, I'm going blind, I've gone blind, and oh, it, it got the Jake walk, where it couldn't control anything. All these things happened during this period, although they took place before and they still take place after, but primarily during that period, which gave us that fear, that absolute fear of I'm going blind uh, if I drink any moonshine. That's where that came from, was because it in fact was actually happening. Now, the gangsters understood the process and they had stills all over the place. And still to that day, to that, at that point, they were producing enough to keep the higher echelon folks and their their customers happy uh, but they still only they still had a large customer base so they still wanted to make more money remember it was a financial gain issue in the first place and it always remains so um al capone elliot ness took down al capone for he was worth like a hundred million dollars in 1930 which was a lot of money okay oh uh, they took them down for tax evasion. So what they did was they continued to spike alcohol with methanol. And so we continued to have that problem. So it continued to perpetuate throughout that period of time. Now, what, here's what was, is really, really interesting on what happened because, you know, in 1933, the United States elected a guy named Franklin FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And then Franklin Delano Roosevelt, one of the first things he did in 1933 was he signed what was called the Cullen Harrison Act. And the Cullison Harrison Act actually amended the 18th Amendment, which prohibited the sale, use of alcohol. The amendment was that he was permitting the U.S. to produce, and even home distillers or home brewers to make beer and wine, provided it was 3.2% ABV or lower. <clears throat> and that was the very start. But guess what? They already had the movement going through the Congress and through the states and I believe, I'm trying to think, uh, I think the record was set, and I, I'm not going to state it because I know that it was, a, it was like a record set for ratification throughout the three quarters of the states. By the time FDR got elected, this whole attitude and idea about prohibition had shifted. It had shifted because people started to see the ill effects more than they saw the benefits of prohibition itself. And so on December 5th, 1933, the same year he actually signed that, December 5th, 1933, prohibition was repealed. 
which brings us to today. Now, why do we still have that problem? And that, oh, by the way, was known as the 21st Amendment. And most of us brewers are, are really familiar with that, the 21st Amendment of the Constitution. So, and that brings us to today. We still have those pockets of unscrupulous, um, uneducated, um, non-caring individuals that will produce a product and then find something off the shelf that's real cheap and they're trying to spike it. And that happens around the world as well. Um, it's very, un, it's more unlikely that you, if you make a five gallon batch and you produce uh, your spirits, that you're ever going to make enough methanol uh, to hurt anybody, provided you don't remove the methanol in a separate container and then drink it straight. That would be, that would be terrible. You'd probably go blind if you did that or come close to it because uh, in most cases you're going to produce about two ounces. And remember from the other video, um, two to eight ounces is considered fatal. It's a fatal dosage. So the, my point is, is, and remember, we don't take the methanol out of wine, we don't take it out of beer, but we just seem to want to we, oh, we not want it. Yeah, we do. We take it out of spirits, and the reason we do that is because we can. And the amount in beer and wine, the concentration is so low because it's spread out over so many bottles uh, that it's not imperceptible, but it doesn't have that adverse effect on us. In our distillate, we would have the same spread out over several containers, uh, so it would be it would be a smaller amount, so it, it wouldn't necessarily, if you drink a bottle, it wouldn't necessarily make you go blind or kill you. Um, but we do know that methanol is what causes us to have a hangover, so we remove the methanol because it's just nasty stuff. So look, folks, please, uh, when all else fails, if you're making a five-gallon batch, it, you start to use the numbers yourself. Uh, please don't try to overthink this. Take the first four ounces, two ounces, four ounces, whatever makes you happy, but a minimum of two ounces, just throw them away, toss them. Uh, you can do the light test, it may even pass. Toss it anyway, get into the habit, have the muscle memory, toss out the first two ounces, everybody's happy. And after that, start collecting your hearts. So. Without further ado, I guess that brings us to an end, and now you know everything you need to know, in general anyway, in a very condensed portion of methanol, why is, uh, how is it possible, why does it continue to happen, and what do I need to know about it? So when you talk to someone else, you can be informed and you can be influential. So please, help keep our community safe, and we'll see you on the next video. Happy distilling.